And welcome, folks. I'm your host, Gregory Hall. This is the Gregory Hall Show, or as now I'm renaming it. It seems like I'm like renaming my show like every week, but now it's called Gregory Hall Live because that makes more sense because I do my show live. But I guess this is the Geek Supremacy Project presents Gregory Hall Live. I'm your host, Gregory Hall, obviously, and tonight I have a special guest in the house, and I'm actually a little starstruck. I'm like fanning out over here a little bit. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce to you actress and performer, Miss Triskin Risk, Little Miss Risk. Hello, how's everyone doing out there? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, stop, stop, don't stop. <laughs> we'll do it again, there you go. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> How are you doing tonight, Tristan? Um, doing well, doing well. It, uh, it was a beautiful day here in Vancouver, super cold, clear, but uh, the sun's gone down, which means I'm just waking up now, and um, yeah, the glampire has come out of her coffin. <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it like funny how like us creative people, you know, artists in the entertainment industry, we, we live like the vampire life. <laughs> oh gosh, yeah. The only time I used to ever see daylight um, when we were doing our like underground parties and raves for about four years or when I was touring with the band is it's like it was like just starting to come up and it's like, oh Jesus, that's coming up. I better go home now. Yeah, cause it, yeah it's like oh, it's like the vamp life and then like because I'm up all hours at night working on things and I got to get with the butt crack of dawn on like an ungodly hour to go to work. <laughs> I'm like in zombie mode. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the natural light, daylight is not kind to those of us who, who live under the cover of shadow. of Like spotlight, that just washes all your, your blemishes and stuff out. You go out there in daylight and people are like, oh, so uh, that's what you really look like. It's just like, oh, don't look at me, don't look at me. You know, you're all jacked up and everything. It's like, it's kind of like when you go to the nightclub and you see a girl and, you know, under the spotlight, she looked good. She's fine. And then, like, you, you know, you hook up with her and then, like, you're dating her and then, like, a couple weeks down the road, you go to pick her up during the daylight and she looks like a freaking jackal. You're like, what the? <laughs> well, I feel kind of bad. If I, like, go home with a guy, it's like we get back to his place or my place. I take off the fake eyelashes. I take off the fake hair. I take off the corset. I take off the high heel shoes. And I'm actually, like, a three-and-a-half-foot dwarf with no teeth. And I'm just like, well, you can go if you want to. I don't mind. And Sorry oh, about it. <laughs> when you, okay, when you go home with a guy, is it like the scene from I'm Gonna Get You Sucker when the chick's, like, taking off her wig and she's taking off her wig? <laughs> <laughs> he's like, my eyes aren't that green. <laughs> he's like, oh. you know, the wind comes off and she falls at it. Then the leg pops off, pops off her ass. <laughs> Well, uh, there's a funny, funny story about that. Was um, We used to tour with a, a band. It was the three-piece band and two dancers, and I was one of the two dancers. But uh, one of the girls we was touring with, she had this, like, bright orange mohawk mullet. But during the show, she wore, like, a Marilyn Monroe-style wig. And I remember one time there's this guy who was standing right up at the front of the stage. Every time she came out, he was just, like, all like, <sighs> And so there's one number at the end where it's a cat fight, and the, the coup de grace of the cat fight is she gets her wig ripped off, and everyone sees she's got this, like, bright orange mohawk mullet white trash thing going on. And that I always, I'll never forget hearing about this guy who just was just like, Ugh, and, like, ran to the back of the room and just, like, you know, illusion blown. And I was like, dude, nobody's hair actually looks like that in real life. That had to be a wig. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's something about wigs that just freak guys out. I know. You know. <laughs> You know, ladies, you, you know, ladies, I into the whole different wigs and everything, but you know, I don't know. It's like that it. scene in Pretty Woman where like Richard Gere comes out of the bathroom with like um, Carol Channing wig hanging on a on a on a hook, and he said you could just see it in his mind. He's like, oh god, what what am I allowed to stay in my fancy hotel room? And then she's got like all this like beautiful long flaming red hair and stuff. Which tr trust me, that's not how it works in real life. It's like if she's hanging up her wig afterwards, it's just like some horrible rat's nest mess, too much bleach jobs, bad head scalp tattoo. I don't know, just. <laughs> Oh, you, know what, I, I'm, I'm just, you know, I've heard things. Well, you know what? I used to women in extensions and all that good stuff. <laughs> you know what? Yeah. I, I like to call it performing enhancers, in my opinion. You know what I'm saying? That's again, a good way to look at it. Yeah, it's like even like plastic surgery. Like, okay, people do steroids, they work out. If you go out and get a breast implant or, you, you know, get an ass shot or lip, in, lip injection, whatever... I like to think of those as performance enhancers. That's all it enhances your performance. So I don't think I'm mm -hmm. wrong with 
I just don't like it when they mess with the face. You know, it's like let's just, <laughs> let's just let you you know because you don't look the same way as you did ten years ago. So you gotta let nature catch up. You know. Yeah, there's a couple people um, I've seen some extreme plastic surgery, and it's not that they're looking like Ruby Real Girl or and before. It's just they have been trying to turn back the clock, and it's just like as a result, they just like they look like all kind of like a little bit mangled. And it was just like, okay, you probably could have stopped a little while ago, but if this is what makes you feel gorgeous, then more power to you. If that like kind of I don't know, looking sort of like that, you know, they get that number of. Um, Surgeries done, and they start to look a little like a burn victim after a while, and it's just mm. like, uh, okay, well, as long as you're happy with how you look, that's what ultimately matters, right? But yeah, it just means I don't look them in the eye sometimes if it's too extreme. It takes me a little while to, because I'm super Canadian about it. It's like, oh, don't look at them. You're going to make them feel weird. Don't make them feel weird about it. <laughs> well, you know what? Yeah, you don't, because you might, thank God you're not epileptic. You might have gone to a seizure or something. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, speaking of, uh, you know, Canadians, you're in Canada, you're Canadian. I want to know, you know, you're Canadian, what is going on in Canada? Because you guys up there are on the front page. I mean, what's going on? First of all, you got Rob Ford, fat ass, okay, you know, <laughs> doing drugs and stuff. And then was you got know, Justin Bieber sleeping with prostitutes, okay. Then you got Michael J. Fox trying to, you know, shake his way back in the sitcom. I mean, what the hell is going on up there with you people? Like, oh, God, yeah. Well, what what can be said? I mean, but we in Canada, we know how to party. Maybe it's just something about that extra little bit of cold that we've got. Or I, I don't know about the East Coast. Apparently, um, back east in Toronto, that's like we smoke pot out here. Back there, they're apparently smoking crack. Um, but we've got like this super awesome hippie uh, pr uh, mayor, Gregor Robertson here, and he's like spending all this money to get bike lanes everywhere on the road. And it's really awesome. And you know, he's got this food scraps recycling process. He's like, we're gonna make Vancouver the greenest city in the world, which I'm like, you know, super happy about. That makes my like inner hippie raver socialist be like, yeah, we're. I don't need a car in this. Town fuck cars. Then you go to. <laughs> we also have like kind of a, a bit of a meth problem. Like yesterday, two days ago, I was walking home um, in the morning and I couldn't catch my bus. And I found out on the news why. It's because the police had like shut down this super main downtown location because there was a major meth lab going on. I was like, oh, okay. Well, it's a good thing Mayor Ford doesn't come out this way because otherwise it would be like if we swapped mayors, like Toronto would be like super green and progressive and it would like, you know, solve all their environmental problems and it would just turn into like Mardi Gras here with Rob Ford buying up all the crack, probably like, you know, rounding up all the, the sex workers and be like, oh, come on girls, let's go to the penthouse, we're going to go have a party and and that would be that and the city would just be like Sodom and Gomorrah on the west coast. Pretty much look like 96 Spring Break or something, Daytona. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, yeah, except I have this horrible thing that Rob Ford would be doing this, and it's just like, oh, dude, no, 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 no. But did you no. see the video? I don't know what the video was when he was, he damn near bulldozed a lady in a meeting. It looked like he ran so fast, it looked like somebody said, hey, the McRib is back at McDonald's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I saw that video, and there was also uh, the video conference where live on the air, when when he'd been accused of like trying to go down on one of his staff members, he's like, "No, I don't need to do that. I have all I can eat at home." And I'm like, "Oh, what's your wife think of that?" She's probably just like, "Wow, I can't believe wow crack and that. I can't believe I ever let you put your dick in me. Wow, that's something." He wouldn't have to smoke crack. I mean, did you have you seen him? Why would anyone want them to for them to stick their dick in them? Have you seen this guy? I mean, well, uh, he's he's not my taste. He's, if you're into that kind of husky ex football player, now has gone to fat um, parties too much, probably is going to die of a heart. Nah, he looks like oh, he looks like he, nah, he looks like the poor man's version of the fat man from Jake and the Fat Man. Okay, that guy. <laughs> is, he, 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 yes, yes, he does. Yeah, I want to know what crack he's smoking because I thought crack was supposed to make you lose weight. He looks really healthy and hefty. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe he should be smoking more of it. Maybe he would get more st like the the town hall meetings in Toronto go on for four days, and like you know he comes out, he's like instead of being like nearly three hundred pounds, he's like a healthy one eighty. You know, he's like walking it off, walking around. He's like making like little murals and stuff. He's cutting up all these little projects. And, his around his lips will be completely white, but like you know, shit will get done. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, I don't know. Something about like crackheads. You get that crusty ass lip thing. I don't know what's going Yeah. But, Toronto loves its rock stars. Um, Margaret Trudeau, uh, Pierre Trudeau's wife, partied with the Rolling Stones uh, back when they played a show there in the 60s. So it's just like Toronto loves a rock star. It's like the more of a train wreck Rob Ford is, the more his popularity rises. I can't, I got nothing. I don't, I don't know. I don't live in Toronto. I don't know what's going up, on up there. Well, All I'm just going is like, well, we're always saying that we don't talk about Canada internationally. SNL is spoofing Toronto now, so yay, we're noticed. <laughs> well, you know, speaking of Canada, Canada ha does, despite all the ratchetness that's coming out of Canada, is also cool, awesome people and a lot of awesome projects coming out of Canada, and which leads me to our next discussion, American Mary. Now, you are one of the stars of American Mary. Now, I actually got a chance to, um, I actually heard about this film the first time way back in March at Monster Mania. Um, and I actually met the star of the film, Catherine Isabel, and um, that's when I first heard about it. But I didn't get a chance to see it until uh, June, and it was streaming on Netflix. And I got to tell you, I enjoyed the hell out of it, especially as a horror movie buff. I really, really, really enjoyed that film. And um, now you play a character, Beatrice Johnson. Now, first off, now how did you even come, you know, how did you get the role of Beatrice or came, came across um, the role of Beatrice? This uh, this actually goes back a few years because I had seen Dead Hooker in a Trunk in the theater initially. Um, I had just, me and my girlfriend were like, oh, let's go see a movie at the Rio because that's like our local independent art house cinema. And it's like, what's playing? Who fucking cares? Let's, we we got to get out of the house. We got to go do something. So we went and we saw this movie and I saw the title. I'm like, this is called Dead Hooker in a Trunk. I don't care what it's about. With a title like that, I'm sold. Let's go. So we went in, and there's that part in Dead Hooker. Have you seen Dead Hooker before? I haven't seen it, but that was the that was their first film, I believe. That was their first film, yeah. That was the screening of it in Vancouver. And there's one part, uh, something happens to Jen's, and I had this big, like, one of those giant um, pop drink containers from the movie theater in between my legs, and I saw it, and it just made something in my head. Go, and I went, Bleh! like, right in between my legs into the cup. And I was like, wow, I didn't think I had any decent revulsion left in my body anymore, but apparently I do. So um, I messaged them afterwards saying, oh man, I saw that, I threw up in the theater, I didn't think I could still do that, this was brilliant, if you ever do anything again, I'd love to help out, let me know what I can do. And it turns out we both had a mutual friend, uh, Kevy Mantle from Fake Shark Real Zombie, um, and he was like, oh yeah, you've got to totally work with this chick, and they're like, I don't know, Kevy, like, <laughs> sure thing, wink, wink, one of your friends, right? Um, but we kind of, the Saskas and I mutually stopped each other for a little while online because I'd like, like everything that they were doing and they'd periodically check in on me. And um, when American Mary came up, they sent me the script and said, do you want to read it? And I said, of course I do. So I read the script and it was like awesome. I had to read it again right away. And then um, they're like, we'd love you to come on board as a dance coordinator for it because there was supposed to be some like pretty big dance scenes and this and that. And so I was like, fuck, I would, be, I would be honored to be able to do that. So I went in to meet with them, and um, when I was sitting there talking to them, and this was the first time I like, actually met them, met them. And they're, I've got Jen and Silva on either side of me, and they're both kind of, you know, it was like I'd known them all my whole life. It was so awesome. And they're like, oh, wow, it's too bad you, you can't act. And I'm like, well, I can act. And they're like, well, it's too bad that you can't do voices. I'm like, I can do voices. What voice do you want? And they're like, we know you can dance. Do you want to come in and read for it? And having read the script, Beatrice was the character I was most attracted to because I thought she was just such a personality. And it was one of those things where it's like, I, I was like, oh, well, they don't have this part in mind for me. It's like, but, you know, I, I'd love to be able to play it. And then as soon as they offered it to me, I'm like, okay, I totally fucking want that role. I didn't want it. I didn't want it. Okay, now I want it. And I was like, I'm going to go in there. I went into that audition. I sang. I stripped. I did the, I did the lines. Everything and I'm like, okay, if there's any other chicks that you think can do this better than me, we'll mud wrestle and I will win. My mud that, wrestling name is Box Cutter. That that is like awesome because that's like the perfect. I always tell people like you can work so hard, but when like opportunity comes, you gotta grab it by the horn, man. Because I there've been a lot of times I've known people to like really work hard, and then when that opportunity comes, they just drop the ball. It's like you took the opportunity, you're like yeah, I'll dance with shit, I can act. I can do voices. Shit, put me in this movie. Like you just took it by the horns, and I think that is just awesome. 
Well, it was also, too, one of those things where you don't, like, there's people who've worked doing acting all their lives, and they've never gotten offered a role that, like, I think this is, like, an amazing role. So I, if I only ever get known for doing this one thing, I can die happy, no regrets. But um, you, you don't often get offered things like this and roles like this, and I felt it was so cool and neat and unusual and iconic that I'm like, anyone who doesn't treasure an opportunity like this is an idiot. So Mama didn't raise an idiot. Absolutely. Trust me. You've got to take that bull bottle horn. Now, you played a character. Now, explain to my viewers a little bit about Beatrice Johnson. Now, you obviously were under makeup, you know, because the character looks like Betty Boop. And mm -hmm. he sounds like Betty Boop. So, uh, give uh, my viewers and listeners a little bit of the character. But don't give any spoilers away just because anybody hasn't seen the film. Even though it's been out for a couple months, you've been living on the rock, go see it, American Marriott, it's streaming on Netflix. Okay, but still, explain to view, my viewers about who Beatrice Johnson is. Um, Beatrice Johnson is a stripper who's had 14 different surgeries to look like Betty Boop, and uh, even though she is not an exact replica of Betty Boop, she just tries to embody all the mannerisms, and she decides she's going to be Mary's friend, and she's kind of Mary's gateway into this subculture that she's a part of, and she just, everyone else is terrified of Mary, and Beatrice just thinks she's, you know, a really talented, eccentric artist, and that's how she sees her and brings all these people into her world, and, um, you know, she's also kind of like a cat. You know how when you're in a room and you're wearing black clothes and there's inevitably a white fluffy cat that takes one look at you and it's like, oh, I am going to be all over you whether you want me to or not. And you're like, no, 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 bad kitty, get away. The cat's just not taking no for an answer. Beatrice is a lot like that. She's like, oh, we're going to be friends now. And it's just like, there's there's no telling her no. It's just going to happen, you know. She like kind of like snuggle rapes you kind of. Like, oh, no, no, it's just going to happen. It's okay. Just don't worry about it. Come on, we're going to go <laughs> hang out. It's like, no, I got shit to do today. No, you don't. Just call in and say you're not coming into work tonight. We're going to go hang out. It's like, okay, well, you're not... Okay, sure, sure. I'm fully coerced into whatever we were doing now. So that's kind of Beatrice's personality a little bit. Now, how long was the makeup process for you? That was two hours into the makeup and two hours to take it off. And that was with two, um, yeah, two effects artists working on me from Masters Effects. They were doing all the work. And uh, the first night I went to just pull the mask off my face, and I, they both leapt at me and, like, grabbed my... They're like, no, 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 don't, don't just pull it off. I'm like, but I'm helping. And they're like... You're not helping. If you rip your face off, you're not helping anything. I was like, <laughs> yeah. I was like how does Rob Perlman do this all the time? <laughs> oh, no. oh, but they God. had the hard job. I had the easy job. I just had to sit there and not fiddle around too much. I, like, just let them do shit to my face. And then they're like, okay, they're not letting us work on you for any longer. You have to go to set. And, I mean, that was after two hours. I'm pretty sure if they'd been giving three hours, they would have done it fully three hours. Like, they were that perfectionist. And usually... They'd get me done, and it would be perfect, perfect, and then they'd call lunch, and I'm like, well, I'm not going to not eat. So I went and eat, and, like, placing the food in my mouth so that I didn't ruin the lips, and then I, I, I fucked up the lips anyway, and it'd be, like, after lunch, trotting back to the makeup thing, and they'd be like, oh, you completely messed up your mouth. That's okay. We can fix that. I'm like, sorry. I need to eat. <laughs> you know? <what> I mean? <laughs> I like unless someone just wants to make me like smoothies and protein shakes for the entire shoot. This is gonna happen. This is happening. <laughs> now, Pat, did you have any other acting background prior to to getting this role? Um, I'd done a musical theater prior to that, and I've done like Friends music videos. Like I'm in C.R. Avery's video for Dungeon of Love, and I'm featured in um, Crystal Precious's music video for Apple Pie. So I'd had a little bit of an experience, but this was my first like kind of full on feature length film and this is my first time especially wearing prosthetics. I loved it. I mean I know some people hate prosthetics, they hate blood, they hate being sticky. I probably like it more than I should. Um, okay, you definitely have I don't know if this is like a gateway know. fetishist thing or something, but it, it could be. I don't know, but <laughs> well you know, well, I don't know about that. No. <laughs> it could be. That's for another show. <laughs> I'm the better show. <laughs> that's 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 for our late night after hour show. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you, said, uh, you said, I want to go see Dead Hook in the Trunk. If you would have said that to me, I'd have been like, you want to see a snuff film? What the hell? Bro? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's Not like Hubble with the shotgun. And uh, the girls actually got quite a bit of flack when the film was touring around. People were like, oh, we can't put that on the marquee. And it's just like, why? If you, if you actually watch the film, the, the whole thing is that it's honoring 
the hooker who's senselessly killed, and it's not exploitative at all. But people just look at the title and they're just like, "Oh, hooker, dead, drunk, drunk." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people in Las Vegas are like, "Man, this is common. What are you talking about now?" <laughs> Yeah, it's like we were going to take the kids out and drive to the desert to the, the all the abandoned cars with all the dead hookers. It's Dead Hooker Gardens, actually. That's a, it's a new thing that they got going on there. <laughs> <laughs> we really fucked up. They really did have the <laughs> Dead Hooker Gardens. A great fertilizer right here. Great. <laughs> Look at the great fertilizer. Holy shit, I'm going to get kicked off. Now, uh, <laughs> so now let, let, let's segue back into the film now. Uh, American Mary now. American Mary now actually dives into the subculture of body modification. But the, the the cool thing about the film that I like that it did not it didn't like paint it in a bad way. You know what I mean? I, I really think they created the characters. You know the directors. Um, I cannot pronounce their their names. I don't want to butcher their names. <laughs> no stuff with an S. Uh, the 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 so the Soka twins. Uh Saska. 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 See, I yeah. didn't want to. I knew they were. I didn't want to butcher their name because I butcher people's last names like it's nobody's business. <laughs> but yes, but the Saska twins really, really wrote characters that were very sympathetic. Like Beatrice, for example. Like I don't give any spoilers away, but what happens to Beatrice? I was watching the film and I was like, Oh no, mm -hmm. not her. She's me. <laughs> like <laughs> why? But it, it, you know, you go into the film culture, it really. Like I'm not in the body modification, but when you watch, you kind of go, I get it. It's not for me, but I get it. It does. It does. It's I can't. One of the things about the body culture, the body modification culture, and this is like going to the more extreme end of things, not just like gauges in your ears or tattoos, but this is for people who have uh, like the alien limb syndrome, where they feel like their arm just doesn't belong there. It feels like it's not supposed to be there, and so that the only way they'll know peace is to have it amputated. Or, you know, from a slightly more conventional point of view, someone who's transgendered. They're born into the wrong body. They know they're in the wrong body, and like it's not a fault of their own. It's and it's, but that's not who they are. You know, like it's like you're being born a man, but you're actually a woman. I can't think of anything worse in the world than to be trapped in a body that's not matched to your brain. You know, like it's kind of terrifying. So I feel a lot of sympathy towards these people who they're like, no, this is a physical process because it's going to reflect who I am on the inside, and it's just like until that's done. I mean, in, you can ask anyone who's there, they're getting a sleeve to finished yet, you know, like they don't want to see it in the in between stages, they just want to be in that finished state, you know? Right. It's like the the guys who get um like the, the snake tongue or like the like the, the devil horns or the like the horns right there and mm -hmm. you know, all these modifications done and it, it's kind of crazy how they can actually do it though. It, it's like very interesting. And I start thinking to myself, like, if I was into body modification, what would I look like? I probably do. See, I'd probably go to the extreme and just say, hey, you know what? Just make me a new guy. Like, cut my face yeah. off and put another face there, like, face off. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to take his face off. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't it be kind of cool if you could just do that? Just, okay, hold on one second and put another face yeah. on. <laughs> just let me slip into something more comfortable. <laughs> Ah, there we go. <laughs> Something like that. Yummy, <laughs> Bob. You can pull off. Holy shit. <laughs> well, are you familiar with uh, the the RPG Shadowrun at all? Uh, no, actually. It's an old old school tabletop game. It came out around Cyberpunk, or Early World of Darkness. Um, but there's it's set in the future, and all these you know, it's it's basically like Cyberpunk plus you know, kind of fairies, dwarves, elves, high fantasy stuff. But one of the things that you can do in this future world is you can like pick like genetic modifications, like you can have elliptical pupils, like a cat, or you can like have scales. So it's kind of like what the future of body modification was. And if that was the case, I'd be like the like total cat creature, like all the time. People would just be like, well, she was pretty once, and then she just decided she really liked animals a lot, probably too much. <laughs> Not in a bestiality way or a yiffer way, but. <laughs> See, I probably, you know, this probably sounds crazy, but I probably do this. I only want to do it for a day, though. This experience, or maybe a week. I would probably just say, hey, 
turn me into a white dude, okay? Because I want to know what the fuss is about, okay? I want to know what it's like to rule the world, okay? So <laughs> make me a white dude so I can, like, not get followed by the cops, okay? <laughs> I have good credit. <laughs> All these things. I, I, I want to know how it is. This for, for, for a week, turn me into a white dude. Okay, I don't know if you're familiar with like this. It was an old SNL skit from back in the day when Eddie Murphy was on there, and he did a skit where he went under makeup and he was a white guy, and he and he would go around as this white dude. He went on the bus and <clears throat> there was like a skit was funny how like you know they were like black people on the bus and then when they leave, then like all the white people party it and he's like sitting there like. <laughs> Like I, like I want to be a white dude for we can go into every bank and see if I can get a loan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And just just do it in a whole bunch of different banks, and as soon as like the week's up, you've got the money, but you can just whoosh, see you later, dick lickers. I'm out of here. <laughs> you would be like, guess who's a Negro? No. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> yeah, it's like, listen, it's not enough that we have a black president, okay? Like... <laughs> I think that's pretty good. Pretty. Um, we're working on hopefully getting uh, Prime Minister Harper out of office in uh, in Canada, and I would really like to see us have like a transgendered or you know gay um, prime minister. Like our minorities up here, Kai. Like, <laughs> it's 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 awesome, and um, you know, just I, I feel like having a conservative white guy who's out of touch with the common needs of the people. I'm like, somehow the election got jacked. I mean, now I know how you guys felt when, like, Bush got elected. It's just like, how did that... I voted. Did you vote? Like, what... how did this How did this go down? Well, that's because that's uh, that shit was rigged. I don't know. <laughs> that shit was like... like it was like, hey, guess what? <laughs> what was, I think it was the second... No, it was the second like, John Kerry's president. Wait a minute. Hold up. Time out. Time out. <laughs> We gotta go to Florida. Some shit can happen, okay? We got to, you know, do this again. Like, what? Really? That is shit of us. Oh, yeah, we messed up. Sorry about that. Sorry, folks. <laughs> got to deal with this guy for another four years. Like, what the hell? Like, seriously? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure that Prime Minister Harper probably uh, borrowed heavily that technology. I'm pretty sure that's what our defense budget was spent on, was uh, Harper figuring out how he could rig the vote, or some person who was making money on the oil rigs in Alberta voted in a minute. I'm like, how the fuck did this happen? Jesus Christ. Well, you I know, don't know. Just think well, you know, it's funny. This is having, you know, President Obama in office, especially now in the second term. It's so funny. Like, for example, like I am a huge fan of the movie Django. Okay, I love that movie. It was great. Okay, now I've not seen 12 Years Slave. I heard it was really good, kind of hard to watch, but it was really good. And now the History Channel is in, um, well, I think they confirmed it, according to reports that they're remaking Roots. Okay, and I'm like this, okay, listen, enough with the slave movies, okay? To me, it's kind of like they're trying to say, like, hey, you know what, you have a black president, but let's keep this in perspective where you guys were at 400-something years ago, okay? It's like, what? like, enough with the slave films, man. Can we be kings and queens or something? Like, <laughs> I'd vote for that. I, I, I'm voting in a black king and queen in uh, in 2014. Like, yes, please. It's kind of like, hey, you have a black president, but let's keep this in perspective where you guys were at 400 years ago. Oh, not forgetting Jim Crow, too. Like, we, we just want to keep in mind that. It's like, okay, enough. We get it. <laughs> Which, if anything, should make uh, Whitey fucking worried. It's like, hey, they came from that to that. You were already overprivileged and fat when you got here. What have you done lately, you know? <laughs> like, it's fucking step up the game. Like, get over yourselves. <laughs> exactly. You know, I, had, I actually had a discussion the other day with a good friend of mine. And I said, you know what? I think white people need an intervention. I think they need an intervention because y'all losing y'all damn minds. Okay, you got Rob Ford smoking crack up there in Canada. Okay, you got Justin Bieber losing his goddamn mind. Okay, sleeping with hookers and stuff, which you, I don't know why you Justin Bieber sleeping with hookers. And then you got Molly Cyrus twerking. Okay, <laughs> yeah. it was just like just everybody stop. Just all of you, just just stop it. You're embarrassing me. Just stop. Not even like embarrassing the populace. Just me personally. I'm just like they don't speak for me. Thanks. Like y'all need to have an intervention with these people. It's like y'all fucking enough for us, okay? Like stop, please. <laughs> yeah, it's like you guys can all go to rehab together. You can have one big happy group grope over there, and we can fix this shit. 
Yeah, you know, it's funny, you speaking on rehab, I actually saw a commercial on rehab, and it's the most hilarious thing, because I was kind of like, shit, I wish I had a drug problem so I can go. It was more like a damn resort. It was like, it was, I don't know what it was, but it was like, you can come to this spa and relax and do yeah. all the things. And I'm like, well, shit, I, I'm, I wish I had a drug habit. I'm about to go do a line of coke so I can go on vacation. What kind of shit? No is kidding. It? It's just like, I think that's worth getting like a smack habit for. It's just like... Yeah, yeah, I'll I'll bust that, and then I'll have seaweed wraps for a week, and I'll eat really healthy food. The coffee enemas uh, might draw the line at that, but yeah, yeah. I thought you said pina colada, not colonic. Jesus, <laughs> I'm like I'm taking you out for dinner first if you're gonna do that to me. Christ. Wow, but um, now let's go. Now done with our discussion of the woes of drugs in the white community. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> drugs are bad, Kai, except for the good ones. <laughs> yes, yes. Are they all good? They're good drugs. Marijuana is a good drug. It's not really a drug. It's more a medicine. Marijuana is not a drug. It's a plant. Okay, let's just put that out there. Okay, it's like, Hallelujah! So <laughs> testify. Okay, it's like cat. Like cat Williams said, it's a plant. It just grows that way. Okay, if you happen to light it, it has some effects to it. <laughs> okay, it's not a drug. It's a plant. Okay, I don't I, make the rules. I just harvest them. <laughs> have you? I have. Don't now. Don't incriminate yourself. Now listen. Me, I don't know how it is, Ken. I'm in the states. You gonna fuck around, get me in trouble? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm my dog. Like cobras. You snitching on yourself now. <laughs> snitching on yourself. But uh, let's go now. You're more than an actress. You're a performer. You're a model, and uh, you do a bit of burlesque. I do a lot of burlesque. So now, <laughs> a lot of burlesque. Now, now, how? When did you start in burlesque? Actually, I started. This will be. This is my eleventh year doing burlesque, which is amazing because I'm still twenty two, right? Um, but uh, I started. <laughs> um, yeah. So I started uh, burlesque. I had been doing modeling. I had a, a non-nude uh, website, and this was back before Facebook, back before MySpace. So this was like OG www dot little mistress, and um, I had been using that to pay for my uh, my my college. And then I wound up. Uh, having a friend having a birthday party for her boyfriend, and he was obsessed with the Marilyn Monroe singing "Happy Birthday," and she knew I did pinup. She's like, "Hey, would you consider doing like the singing and doing like a little strip tease for him?" So we drank a giant bottle of Jack Jackson Triggs uh, white wine, and we put together like the most ghetto cardboard blue gun cake thing ever. It looked it looked like what you would expect like third graders to make a cardboard cake out of. Um, so it wasn't glorious, but apparently he liked it because he asked if I'd open for his band the next week, and I was like, oh, sure, I'll put some numbers together, no, no big deal, and it just kind of started from there. I finished my schooling, and then immediately didn't work in my field. I got my practicum, my certificate, and I was just like, great, I'm going to go on tour as a stripper with a rock band, sweet, so I did that for six years, and um, I'm part of a troupe in Vancouver, so I mean, it's been something that's been the the, the driving factor in my la life the last decade or so, so it's performed in 12 different countries, seen a lot of the world, um, yeah, it's kind of weird to think that I've flashed my comely udders at uh, many people worldwide in many different countries at this point, in many different situations, but, uh, you know, it's a good way to travel and see the world if uh, in, in this economy, because there's no way I could have done that on my own without doing the showgirl thing. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny. It seems like with the economy being the way it is, it's like it's definitely making artists, you know, it's forcing artists to be like, hey, I got to take my craft very seriously now. And it also forces you to be creative to find ways to make a living off it. Absolutely. Yeah, it is. It's, uh, it's it's not it's it, I, it's not easy to live as an artist. I mean, you can do it and it can be done. But you're going to have to realize that there's going to be some creature comforts that you're going to have to go without. Um, I mean, unless you're wildly commercially sex successful. I don't have a problem with people who are commercially successful because it's like, awesome. You, you figured it out. You figured out the magic combination. It's like when Dita started to get popular and everyone was like, oh, yeah, Dita Von T's eye roll. And I'm like, no, shut up. Like, she started in strip bars and in Penthouse magazine, and now she's, like, at, like, front row at Paris. No, fuck you for looking down on her like that. Like, this woman has, like, she's made it. She's made it socially acceptable for people like me to do what I do for a living and not go, isn't that, like, stripping? And I'm like, well, it is stripping, but, you know, it's, you know, strip tease, not just strip strip. 
yeah, it's, a, it's an art form to it. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, also with the, the Pussycat Dolls, and not the music group, but when it started out, actually, you know, as a well, last show. Mm -hmm. and, and it's funny, it's kind of like when you mentioned going to commercial, it's like that's what we all strive to, to be. It's kind of like, well, so-and-so sold, sold out. They're, they sold out. It's like, yeah, that's what we're trying to do. I don't want to be fucking peddling and fucking like... <laughs> well, yeah, that's just it. It's like, hey, they sold out. What, you mean they're able to pay their bills and make a living off of what they do? How dare they, you know? Like, what kind oh, of... What, how, what, what is this weird... how dare they? How dare they make a living? <laughs> how dare they do what they love and actually make some money and actually achieve their dreams? <laughs> yeah, fuck you know, them for, for selling out, man. It's just like, why? So you can feel better about yourself? Like, screw you. <laughs> you know what? You know what? Let's, let's get the gong for the haters out there. For the haters. No, yeah, exactly. All the haters, man. I can, I can just say, like, lick me to the hipsters and the haters. Don't give me stuff. Don't give me stuff on hipsters. <laughs> don't give, you mentioned the word on my show. You mentioned you mentioned the word hipsters. Now I'm getting angry. I'm about to rip my jacket, I'm about to turn to the Hulk. I hate hipsters. Oh, I hate them. And they little stupid little hipster mustaches and they little stupid little scarves and, and, and all the girls that wear the big old glasses. Let me tell you something. Now, I am wearing these glasses. Now, granted that they are fake, but I wear them for fashion. But let me tell you something. Now, I have a pair of descriptive glasses because I am nearsighted, okay? So, therefore, I don't wear them on camera because there's, you know, a little bit of reflection. But I hate wearing these big ass glasses. No good guy, they well, they ain't. They can see, okay? Don't like it, okay? Then they walk around, think everything's just so ironic. It's like, well, I bought this shirt at a thrift store for, a thrift store for five bucks. It's like, no, you didn't. You bought that Urban Outfit for 40 bucks. Stop it. Absolutely. It's like, fuck you, hipster. It's like, I know where you got that stuff. You still have the tag on, motherfucker. And yeah. not to mention that, but most of those kids that I know who are hipsters are trust fund babies. So I'm just like, yeah, it's great that you're struggling as an artist. I'd like to see you do that without your parents' support. And car. Exactly. It's like, yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, well, I'm a struggling artist. I, I'm, I'm majoring in fine arts. It's like, no, you, you majored in like something else, and you just went to like an art show. It was like, hey, that's what I'm going to do. Like, no, stop it. Like, you know what I mean? It's, oh. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, yeah, I'm an artist in my, like, giant trust fund loft downtown that costs a bazillion dollars, and, like, as opposed to, like, the real artists I know who are, like, living, you know, five people in one house in East Van, trying not to, like, live in each other's pockets, right? <laughs> like, I was just like, uh-huh, so you're an artist, huh? You're either an artist or a drug dealer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, like, you're an artist living in your, uh... Two million browns, two million dollar brownstone in Brooklyn. Okay, let me tell you yeah, something. Yeah, 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 exactly you know, right. Never come to New York City. Stay the hell out of Brooklyn. Okay, it is not what it's present to be. Everybody, oh, Brooklyn, Brooklyn, Brooklyn. Listen, I'm a Manhattanite. Now I love Manhattan. Okay, stay out of Brooklyn because it's infested with hipsters. Okay, <laughs> with trust fund babies going around drinking their Starbucks coffee. Ah, oh, this makes me angry. And hey, you know who the worst type of hipsters? And you can appreciate this because you're a nerd just like you're a nerd just like I am. Mm -hmm. These type of hipsters, they, they give us nerds a bad name, Tristan. And that's the hipster nerds, okay? Well the nerds that get what I like to call hipster nerd syndrome. Okay? Those are like self hating nerds. They'll be mm -hmm. the ones that I know mean a lot of shit for this, but I don't really give a shit. Those, those are the ones that be online on Facebook, that be sitting there playing like they movie critics. Like they all of a sudden they movie critics, they go to film, like well, you know, I I saw The Dark Knight Rises. Now, it was a good film, but, you know, it just wasn't as great as the last one. And, and, and this, and start nitpicking at it, and it's like, shut the fuck up and enjoy the goddamn movie. Anybody got time for that? Like, I don't need you, okay, Cisco and Ebert. Like, shut up, okay? I don't want to read about your blog, about you being a movie critic. I have gotten some online arguments. It's ridiculous. Like, well, I'm a critic. It's like... No, you're not. You know what you are? You're a film student that couldn't cut it. So now you got to sit there and criticize everybody else. <laughs> and yet you know, however, if these people ever met Nolan or Christian Bale in, in person, they'd shit themselves. They'd be like, oh, my God. Oh my God. They'd be like, hey, you know, um, I really felt the cinematography in this was, a bit, was subpar. They're not going to say that. And if they do, well, a headshot is required, like, just psh, at that point. I'm just like, I'm just going to put you down because if you don't have the sense not to say that to somebody's face... 
But the, the the thing is, they're not accountable because they're they're like, oh, like Chris Nolan's gonna read my review as a random blogger and like get in my face about it. It's just like, no. But if you can't say anything nice, keep your fucking mouth shut. You know, like. <laughs> Exactly. What movies have you done that gross that kind of box office? I'd like to know. Exactly. Like I hate that. It's kind of like it's like what like money have you made off a of box office? Like, and and the the thing that really upsets me the most is when you see other artists hate on other artists. It's kind of like you should have I don't want to say sympathy, but you should have an understanding. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. like I I would be petrified if I was going to like put a movie out. Like, cause I'd be like so scared of the scrutiny. Like, oh man, am I gonna get like roasted because some some like hipster nerd out there is not gonna like my shit? Like, <laughs> you're really wearing your heart on your sleeve when you make film because that's just that's such an extension and it does leave you feeling really vulnerable. And I can see why a lot of people when they get like um, bad uh, bad static about any projects that they worked on that they withdraw a little bit. Understandably, it's just like you know reading the review of your musical and like, oh well. They thought the set pieces were really nice. <laughs> well, they found something they liked about it. That's good. <laughs> you see, that's the thing. But that's like, you see, but that's like the that's the weakness. You know, what I'm saying in your armor, like that's the weakness in your armor is your art. Because any art doesn't matter what you do. That's an extension of you. That's who you are. So mm -hmm. people are going to attack that, and it does hurt. You know what I mean? It does it would force somebody to lash out or? Or feel withdrawn in some way, you know what I mean? And the, one of the best quotes I think Kevin Smith said, the director uh, Kevin Smith said, is that, and he got a lot of flack for this, but I thought the genius when he said, "Critics don't matter anymore." It's true. When he said, "Critics do not matter anymore," I mean, he got a lot of flack for him, but it's so true because everybody's a critic now. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, you want to make him? I mean, I think his next film is a movie called Tusk, which is about yes. a, a dresses up in a war. Sounds so crazy, but it sounds interesting. But you know what? But he's like, who cares? I'm going to do this movie. You know what I mean? And I think mm -hmm. you have to go out and just do it. I think part of being an artist, no matter if you're an actor, singer, dancer, comedian, whatever, is bravery. Like, you have to be brave. You have to have a lot of courage, especially nowadays. It's important to keep things in perspective, too, and just remember that everyone has an opinion, and opinions are like assholes, and that everybody else stinks, right? So, I mean, just anything that anybody says about your art, you just take it with a grain of salt. As long as you feel compelled and driven to keep making what you do, and you've got a story to tell, or you've got something that visually you want to project or present to people, it's so important to just be able to be like, fuck it, I'm still doing this. Like, you're not going to stop me from doing this. <laughs> what is this high school that you make me feel so bad about myself that I give up my art? Right. <laughs> you know, and good. Well, as soon as they see you in person, they want to. They want to do this. Oh, hold on, one second. Okay, Bendos, I kiss your ass. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and, and haters can kiss the fattest part of my posterior. It's just like right there. You got a problem? Please direct your comments right there to the booty. Thank you. Listen, if you have a problem with me, you're hating on me and my show. You can do this. You can go to the cabinet. Find some pills and pop them in your mouth, okay? Or throw yourself out the window and slit your throat on the way down because I can give two flying shits. I'm still do me. <laughs> Unless that's the mentality that you have to have. I know that sounded pretty, that sounded pretty wild, didn't it? <laughs> what the hell is wrong with me? <laughs> Holy shit. The, the, the thing that. <laughs> It's interesting, too, because it's just, like, with the hipster geeks, like, they'll talk about, oh, I like the X-Men before they were cool. I like them before the movies. So did a lot of people, especially, like, in the late 70s, early 80s, when they first came out. Like, this is, you did not discover this. This is not a new thing. What I do like about how it's more accessible, I went to um, Toronto for Fan Expo in August, and I was part of Room Morgue's Festival of Fear, Fear there. And it was so cool because it was like it shows that it's an it really is for the most part an inclusive culture. Like I mean, I saw people cosplaying as like anime and video game people that I didn't recognize. I'm like shit, I'm out of touch. And then I'm like, no, it's just that there's so much of that. And you know, and me being the person that I am, I was like, oh, I should cosplay something. And I'm like, oh, I don't I don't have anything that's like good enough to be cosplay because if you can't 
call it in when you're cosplaying at one of those things because one of two things will happen. A, no one will recognize what you are if you're just kind of phoning it in. Or B, you're inevitably going to run into someone dressed as the same thing as you, but their like outfit's going to be like totally pimp and amazing, and you're just going to be like, wow, I just I didn't even try, you know? <laughs> like, that party city. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, you spent all of five minutes and five dollars on that. That's great. See, here's the thing with me. I don't see. I don't care because I I have come out and said this, and I'm proud of this. I am a lazy cosplayer, okay? Because anybody got time for that, okay? I'm lazy because this is me. Because every year I go to New York Comic Con. So every year I'm like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pimp it out. I'm going to go there. I'm going to make the most badass cosplay. I'm going to spend months on it. I'm going to work on it. It's going to be great. Months will roll by, and I'm just like, <laughs> you know what? Yeah, this, you know what? I got, I got a job. I got to go to work. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing, too, is, like, there's a lot of cosplay that's fucking amazing, and it blows my mind, but it's not appropriate to going to a crowded place where you're going to be bumping into people constantly. Those bitches that wear fairy wings or angel wings or have, like, the big hoop skirts that, like, act oh. as cow catchers that they're going through, I'm like, no, that looks great. Take a photo of it and then post it online. Don't fucking wear that to the convention. Just don't. Yes, I almost got my eye poked out by one of the damn fairy people with these damn big-ass well like. Oh, hey, man, I'm pull my damn eye. What's wrong with you? Mm -hmm. I, saw, I saw one guy cosplay as Wolverine and had real claws, and, like, New York Comic Con literally is like this with so many people bumping together because it's so crowded. I'm like, dude, you're going to fucking slice the shit out of somebody. What the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I saw this one chick who was in this like fucking sick ass um like lady De left lady Deadpool outfit, and it was great. And the whole time I'm watching her, going, "Oh man, that she needs to plan her poo basically because it's like if you are in a situation, first of all, it's gonna take you forever to get to the bathrooms. Okay, just be prepared. It's gonna take at least five to ten minutes to get from wherever you are in the hall to where the actual bathrooms are." Then, if you're a chick, that's even assuming that there isn't a giant lineup of, pe of chicks waiting to get in to use the stalls. Then you've got to get out of your outfit to go to the bathroom, which, cool. you know, if you're wearing one of those crazy, like, latex leather deals, looks great. Like, you need, like, a spotter or something to unzip you and unhook you and all that shit. And it's just like, so if you have to go all of a sudden, you didn't plan your poo, like, beforehand, you're just like, oh, shit, now, like, it, it's going to be a photo finish you might be in trouble, and that's a bad thing, where it's like, you know, it's like, oh, it's 11.30, I know what my body does every time, I better start slowly making my way over to the lavatory, because I know this is going to take a minute. If it doesn't, great, you're in, you're out, but I see, like, I see all these people in these, like, super intricate costumes, and I'm just like, oh, they're going to have difficulty peeing in that. Oh, yeah, it's like you got to have, like, some sort of, like, game plan just to take a piss, it's like, what the hell? <laughs> yeah, well, it's like that's one of the times when it would be like legit for girls to go to the bathroom in pairs. It's like, okay, you get me out of my costume, I'll get you out of your costume, and I'll, we'll help each other get back into our costumes afterwards. Wow. Now, n let me ask you a question. Now, you've been to a lot of conventions. Now, have you ever ran, because I've listened, the first level at New York Comic Con was crazy. Have you ever encountered a bunch of thirsty ass dudes, like, just being straight thirsty, like, and if you don't know what thirsty is, okay, that is slang, but totally desperate and hitting on women a lot. <laughs> there are definitely some people who I would say, they're good people, they're nice people, they might even be charming people, but they're mildly to majorly socially retarded, and they don't really know how to interact like they might just spend a lot of time on their own or in a basement or I don't know just they don't get out much and so they don't know um, what inappropriate like appropriate and inappropriate like social intercourse is so it's just like okay if you're taking a picture with the chick who's dressed in a really awesome costume it's appropriate to take one it's not appropriate to be like wait that was fuzzy okay oh, can we get one more oh can we get one more with the kid okay can we get one without the kid is like Okay, no, when you're stopping people for photos, and this goes both ways, like, get your one photo and move on. It didn't work out, tough shit, kept time to move on, you know? Wait, listen, um, I'm just a character, this is not Disney World, I'm not Mickey Mouse, okay? One picture, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are definitely some some thirsty folk who uh, who have gone to some of the conventions I have. Most of them are really nice. It's just there's been some people who just they they either haven't talked to a lot of people in person or they just don't know how or like I mean, I get socially awkward around people if I'm in a room with a lot of people I don't know. Um, I usually either default to swearing a lot or telling really inappropriate stories. I know that never happens, right? Or drinking, and I've had to cut out the drinking thing because the drinking leads to dancing, which leads to let's make a let's make an Instagram feed, let's do this Vine video. Hang on, I've got to go get more glitter, and so on and so forth. And it just kind of escalates from there until I wake up somewhere, usually somewhere I'm familiar with, but just like crawling under somewhere to to, to sleep it off. So I try to just you know relax when I'm in public and just be a nice person versus you know worry about am I being entertaining enough. Am I, am I boring people when I talk? It's like, no, I don't think they really give a shit. I could be reciting multiplication tables and they'd be staring at my boobs. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, hey, 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 hey. Well, I actually, I had that little bit <laughs> It's like, should I just make my boobs talk? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I interviewed some, I actually interviewed um, someone who else was, somebody else that was an American marriage. She had a small role, um, Samantha Mack. Yes! And, uh, 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 shout out Samantha Mack. She's awesome. Okay. She's rad. Uh, and and uh, yeah, I have to get her back on the show. She's awesome. Absolutely. And, um, and um, <laughs> as you, if you know Samantha, she's very well endowed. And, uh, as I'm in, I'm <laughs> I felt so bad because I'm interviewing her. And if you look at the interview, you have to go to the archives. You can literally see my eyes like this throughout the entire interview. <laughs> yeah. hmm. And I'm just have a straight face, and I'm looking like at the playback. I'm like. Dude, you are fucking cool. You are. Fucking <laughs> but they're just they're just right there and Yeah, I'm like, you are fucking scum lord. Like you are king of the creeps. Like what the hell? <laughs> Do you want to be on my show so I can stare at your tatas? <laughs> like, I didn't realize like they were big. I mean, I was just like, hmm. <laughs> You're like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's a great point, Sam. Mm -hmm. That's, like, uh, that's, that's mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was one of the hardest interviews I ever had to conduct. But uh, <laughs> but no, I I saw a lot of thirsty dudes at some cons. Like you know, they see a lot of these women who are very attractive, and you know, they're cosplaying, and they'll they'll see the ones that look very sexy. You know, the, the, like the, like a sexy cat woman or or rogue or something. And you know they get thirsty, cause them to lose their damn mind, like they never saw a pair of tits and ass before. And then they act thirsty, get all desperate, and they ain't trying to hit on them, knowing good and goddamn well they ain't gonna hook up with them. Either three things are gonna happen: either she has a boyfriend, she's married, or she just does not want your plain punk ass. Okay, and ninety percent of the times it's the third one. <laughs> she don't want your punk ass. So no, fellas, cons not the best place to be being thirsty and hooking up with chicks. I mean, yeah. granted, I you know what? I met some cool people there, but I, I did get a little thirsty. I got a little thirsty. I admit it. But it was more stark. <laughs> hey, at least okay. you're honest. I, 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 it was honesty on my show. But it was more, <laughs> I was starstruck. Now, anybody knows me, I had a huge crush on Apollonia from the Apollonia 6, you know, Apollonia from Purple Rain when I was a kid. Who and doesn't? It was, it was so random, too. I was on the showroom floor, and like, I walked past somebody, I'm like, this looks very familiar. And some dude, he was way older than me, he was like, oh my god, I used to love you back in the day. I'm like, no, that's not Apollonia. And it was Apollonia. And then I finally approached her, and I turned into like the Yee Yee's dude. Like, I met a lot of people. I met Zachary Levi, I was cool. Like, I met so many people I was cool with. But when I got to her, I turned I turned into like this quintessential stereotypical geek. I was like, uh, excuse me, uh, <laughs> so I I used to have a question when I was a kid, you know, purple rain, <laughs> so beautiful. So I, yeah, can, do you mind if I get a picture? And she's like, sure. And I'm just like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, it's like, and I came in my pants. <laughs> yeah, like just in my pants. And <laughs> I was like, oh my god, she smells so good. Like, you sound like a creep, Greg, stop. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, now you have to go and buy like expensive perfume because the last thing I want people at con saying is like, oh yeah, Tristan Risk, I hung out, she was funny, she made a fart joke, but man, she smelled ripe, or she smelled like hippie, she smelled like potpourri and bong water and whatever and ugh, patchouli and shit. I'm like, no, I better buy some fucking Christian Dior stuff or something because I do not need that on my ego. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Well, you know, you always go, make sure you wash your ass. You don't want to put fragrance on top of funk. That's a bad combination. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. Don't, yeah, you never do that. <laughs> yeah, you know, there are some funky people at cons, you know, seriously. It's like you turn around, it's like, I know the universal language is mathematics, but it should be wash your ass. Like, you should not. No kidding. It's like you almost kind of want to hand out baby wipes to people and be like, here, you, you might need this. I suggest between your ass cheeks. Exactly. Like, <laughs> like ugh. I don't get people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <you snore. laughs> yeah, it's my handicap. I have to live with it. I sneeze multiple times and I snort when I laugh. Round of applause. I love that. I love that. Oh yeah. Hey, you know, in all fairness, girls get thirsty too. Like I um. I was watching, uh, I was at the panel for Bitten, um, which is a werewolf series that's coming out in 2014. And it's like one one chick, a bunch of dudes, and watching a little preview, those dudes do not wear clothes a lot of the time. And it's all it's going to be like the new True Blood, but with werewolves, like based on, primarily on werewolves. And I'm watching this and I'm like, doo, 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 doo. and then like that reptilian part of my brain took over and I'm like, wow, his stomach looks like the underside of a turtle. <sighs> And, you know, like, my eyes glazed over a little bit, and I, like, got a little, like, drooly, and I just, I noticed I'm, like, I'm, like, I haven't heard a thing any of those guys have said in the last ten minutes. That's not a good sign. <laughs> and then just watching, like, the fans follow the boys like a flock of migrating birds after the pan, I was just like, oh, so this is, like, what, the equivalent of geek beetle mania. Hmm. Good to know. It's like washboard abs to took over your, your brain, took over your psyche. Yeah, I know. I just want to do this. Just over and over and over, and it's like it's not like something I out of my way go for, but if it's in front of me, I'm just I'm gonna look right. Like it's like if you're at a strip club, it's like you don't want to objectify anyone, but if it's right in front of you, obviously you're gonna look. If I was on stage, I'd be insulted if people were sitting right there and not looking at me. It's like, uh, hello, <laughs> this is happening right now. It's not the internet. Yeah, it's like, well, you know, it, it's it's kind of funny because it's like women, you know, you, you do it with class, though. You know what I mean? Like, you do it with class, like, you'll see a good-looking guy walk by, you'll just be like, oh, mm, he's sexy and cute. And then, like, that'd be it. Men, you know, we're like, <laughs> yo, 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 look at that ass. <laughs> look at it. Look, yo, get that shit, man. Like straight, like <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's 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 nature. You just you can't help it, right? And then like and that even that's fine. It's more like ten minutes to an hour afterwards, and staying usually between four to twenty feet away the whole time, but with not saying anything. It's like at that point, it's like, do you have something you want to say to me? Do you got do you have something to say to me? Because right now you're just creeping me out. I've seen enough you know, to know how this why goes. Do guys, why don't guys do that? You'd be at the supermarket just buying your groceries. You know, you're in, you're in the dairy aisle buying your milk for your cereal, and all of a sudden you see some guy staring at you that he likes you, and he's just like... And you're like, what the fuck is this deal? And it's like, no, man. It's the three-second rule. Like, if you're gonna, if you, if you want to talk to a young lady, okay, three seconds. If you are not react in three seconds, leave it alone. Because now you're going to second-guess yourself. You'll be staring at her. She's going to get creeped out, and then... Guess what? You're not going to get any. You know, if you keep mm -hmm. doing that, you might as well donate your penis to charity. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know what? Hey, if you have to say something, good default is do you know if they sell Lucky Charms here? If you're at the supermarket, because then it's like, okay, no, I don't know if they have Lucky Charms. You eat Lucky Charms? Who eats Lucky Charms? Wow, you can actually eat that shit? Wow. It gives you a starting point for conversation. You know what I'm saying? Um, or she can be like, fuck you, uh, get lost, and be like, okay, well, that's. Uh, <laughs> That's that, but you know, for the hopefully she'll, you know, if she's Canadian, she'll be polite enough to talk back to you. But it's kind of scary. There's a book called The Gift of Fear, and it talks about how as women we're conditioned to when someone talks to us and we're in like, you know, we're waiting for the bus or we're doing this, we feel compelled to acknowledge them. And if we don't acknowledge them, we're it's like we're worried about being called a bitch. And it's like, well, no, you're approaching a woman at night alone. Like, what did you think was going to happen, right? Like. I'm not compelled to uh, to get into a conversation with you about stuff. So it's like, for guys, they don't see that situation as a threat. If you're seeing it as a woman, 
you're like, hey, does this end up with like my bullet riddled corpse in a ditch somewhere and my parents crying on the the news? Hopefully not. So, but guys don't see that. They're like, oh, why won't you talk to me? She's such a stuck up bitch. And it's like, no, yes. I'm by myself. Like, how do I know you're not an axe murderer? You have to see it from a woman's perspective. It's kind of like the, the on-street harassment that women face. It's like, you're, you you know, you're going to the bus stop, you know, or you're coming home from work and you're tired, you just want to go, you know, home, or you're just in line at the, your local, you know, fast food restaurant trying to order number two with no pickles, and some guy comes up to you and is like, hey, what's up? And you're like, dude, I'm just trying to order number two with no pickles. Super size. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, <laughs> the fact that it's super sad should give you an idea of my friend of frame of mind right now. Lots of salt, lots of sugar, PMS might be in play. Now is not your time to talk to me about this shit. And Kai, <laughs> like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> <laughs> get gone. Get gone. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, so we are coming to the end of our show. So now I want to play a little game with you. Not so much again. Well, Is that wait? I, I I saw a saw. I know how this ends. Where's the fucking key? I'm I'm not that smart to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not that smart. Listen, if I if I was uh if I was a horror movie killer, I'd probably be caught in the first five minutes of the film. Just, <laughs> You'd be I'm like, just, shit. Okay, well, you got me. <laughs> I'm just too lazy. Like I'd start stabbing the shit out of people and be like, oh man, I gotta clean up all this blood. Oh well. <laughs> Well, if it worked for OJ getting off, maybe it worked for me now. <laughs> yeah, that's not my glove. It doesn't fit. <laughs> but there's not so much a game. It's a little segment. I would like to interview Beatrice if she's available. She's totally available. So, Beatrice, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing fine, thank you. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. You know, you, you have such a lovely voice. Like, you're just, you're like a ray of sunshine. Oh, thanks. <laughs> it's usually easier to tell people to fuck off when they talk like this because generally no one takes me seriously, even though I usually mean fuck off. You know, if you told me to fuck off, I wouldn't even be mad because you're just so polite. I would just be like, you know what? She told me to fuck off. You I'm fuck gonna off, do but you do it with a smile on your face. <laughs> exactly. I will look at you and go, you know what? I'm going to fuck off. You have a good day. <laughs> And walk away and be like, you are so sweet. <laughs> She's like, I hope she tells me to fuck off again. That would be really nice. <laughs> Let me ask you a question, Beatrice. Now, now you are, are you're a very beautiful woman, but you, you kind of resemble uh, someone. Um, Betty Boop. Now, what, what, is your, your, um, what, what is your love of Betty Boop come from? Well, who doesn't like Betty Boop? She's a universal sex symbol, even though she's not, you know, a conventional beauty. She doesn't have, you know, um, overly exaggerated womanly charms, but she does. I dare you to find me one person in the world who doesn't like Betty Boop. Now, this is true. And, and you could have gone with Jessica Rabbit. Maybe she, she was quite hot. Oh, yeah, Jessica was gorgeous, but eh, it's not really my thing. <laughs> So let me ask you a question, Beatrice. Are, are you single? Hmm. Well, I kind of have a, a, a lady friend. She has a lot of uh, body modifications, too. Oh, oh, oh. oh so She's a very talking. funny girl. So, 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 so let me ask you this. So what do you look in, you know, look for, for a partner? Oh, I like, I like kindness. I like generosity. I like someone who likes small dogs. Um... They also have to be, you know, fairly liberal-minded. You know, I'm not exactly what you would call a conventional girl. <laughs> so, so do you like to be wine and dine? You know, because they say chivalry is dead, but I don't think chivalry is dead. You like the doors open for you and oh, all those things like that. <laughs> well, I've had a lot of my regulars come and, you know, they like to make it rain on me. And who doesn't like to be caught in a rainstorm? <laughs> Oh, uh, this is true. This is true. Now, you know, let me ask you this question. Have you ever ran into some cheapskates in your line of profession? Oh, you're always going to run into scoundrels no matter where you go. Just, just throwing you like a dollar and you, you know, because obviously I wouldn't throw you a dollar. Actually, I, I wouldn't even throw money at you. I, I would spend money on you. I, I would, I would treat you, you know, very nicely and, you know, show you that chivalry is not dead because you are very lovely. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, if you're willing to bring chivalry back from the dead, then that sounds delightful. <laughs> so now, now, how are you re re recuperating? Because you know, you know, you kind of went through some things. You know, I, I saw. You know, are you doing fine? <laughs> Well, nothing that a good surgeon couldn't fix in the end. I know a couple good surgeons. Do you think I need surgery? Oh, you don't need surgery. You're perfect. You might want to get laser eye surgery, though. You know, just so you lose the glasses. They look good, but, you know, just for swimming purposes. If you're in a pool. Yeah, this is true, because I wanted to get contacts, but the thought of touching my eye freaks me the hell out. <laughs> what else <laughs> freaks you out? Ooh, what else freaks me out? You know freaks me out? Believe it or not, dead things. Yeah, Anything it, dead. You're, get, you're into the geek things and horror and, and dead things. That's what freaks you out. Did you have a bad experience with maggots when you were little? No, not really, but I don't know. It's very weird because I love horror films, but, you know, I, you, you wouldn't catch me at a funeral, put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess it's the difference between theory and practice. <laughs> Just <laughs> you think about all the hookers you once, but in practice, he probably shouldn't deal with prostitutes. Uh, this is true, because someone end, end up dead in the trunk. <laughs> Who was it? I think it might have been, was it Robert Downey Jr. or Rob Lowe when he was having an interview about the Heidi Fleiss thing, and they say, well, you're a good-looking guy. Why do you have to pay for it? And he goes, I'm not, pay <laughs> I'm not paying for the services. I'm paying for them to leave. I'm like, well... I guess if you're famous, that makes sense. <laughs> oh, this is true, because there's nothing worse than having, you know, having a booty call or a booty text come over, and then after you, you know, do the deed, you're like, okay, <laughs> you can go. Uh... <laughs> it's like, oh, you're still here. <laughs> you should probably go now. Like, uh, I think the bus, you know, the buses do run another three hours. You know? <laughs> Let me call you a cab. <laughs> exactly. It's like, no, no. But Beatrice, I, I want to thank you for coming on my show. Thank you so much. You're a delightful young lady, and, and I wish you the best. Well, thanks for having me. <laughs> here, folks, here for Beatrice Johnson. <laughs> you spoil me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tristan, you are a joy. You are a talented, talented young lady. I thank see you. big things happen for you in the future. <laughs> really do. So uh, let my viewers know where they can reach you at or if you have any upcoming projects or events that are yeah, coming up that they can see you in. Um, well, watch out in 2014 for Astron 6's The Editor, um, Jill 6's short film The Call Girl with me and Lawrence Harvey from Human Centipede 2 and 3. And I am in a segment for a anthology that's coming out in 2014. And I can't say which segment and I can't say which film, just know that it will be out in 2014 and I will be pimping the shit out of it when I can. Um, in the meantime, people can check me out on Twitter at Little Miss Risk or my website which is littlemissrisk.ca because I post nearly naked if not naked photos on there plus my blog and uh, you know, I usually sometimes remember to even put updates when I'm performing. So if anybody's interested in stalking me, I make it really easy online. <laughs> yeah, so please check out um, uh, Little Miss Risk and you know all her things, and you know hopefully we'll definitely get you back on the show when all your other projects come on. You're always welcome to come back anytime. You are a friend of the show. Thank you so much for coming awesome. on. Awesome. Well, really thank good. you very and much well, for having me. It's been delightful. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you so much. It really has. And the folks, you can follow me on Twitter at Gregory Hall Five Thousand to find out find out all your updates on anything from the Geek Supremacy Project. We have some couple other shows coming up tomorrow. I'll be back on air with my partner, Jen Nagel, for the Greg and Jen Show tomorrow. So please tune in for that, 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific. It's going to be a good one. You know, Greg and Jen Show, you want all your pop culture stuff and see all the shenanigans and see what classy meets ratchet, come to the Greg and Jen Show and check us out. And uh, we're going to be signing off. Thank you so much, Tristan, for coming on again. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and we're going to sign off. I'm Gregory Hall. This is Gregory Hall Live. Peace. <laughs>